Okay, I want to thank everyone for joining us. My name is Rhonda Schaffler. Great to have you with us. For the next 20 minutes or so, we are going to be discussing robotics and artificial intelligence and how they can be deployed by businesses to ensure state-of-the-art safety. I am so pleased to welcome for this important discussion, William Santana Lee. He is chairman and CEO of Nightsco. Now, before we get into it, I want to remind everyone, we want to hear from you. So please use the text chat to the right of your screen to post questions, to engage in our discussion. And we're going to incorporate as much as we can today in our session. Bill, so good to chat with you. Thanks so much. Good to see you, Rhonda. Greetings from Silicon Valley. <laughs> you already get my vote for best background, which we're going to get to in just <laughs> a moment. But you and I are going to spend our time talking about what Nightscope is doing and the landscape for technology and AI and robotics. And that's where I want to start. Set the landscape for us. What capabilities are out there that some of the executives joining us right now might not even be aware of? Uh, there's a ton of capabilities that are out there, and then there's a lot of promotional stuff that's not kind of ready for prime uh, I think to maybe set the context, uh, one, on self-driving autonomous technology, um, you know, depending on who you believe in terms of math, about $80 billion has gone into self-driving autonomous technology. There's 200 companies working on it, uh, and no one's sh literally shipped anything. Uh, you probably haven't run a an errand or, or what have you in a self-driving vehicle. And it's because it's technologically extremely difficult. I, I believe Nightscope's the only company in the world operating 24 seven, uh, fully autonomous without any human intervention across an entire uh, country. I think the other one that I find a little bit more humorous is, is robotics just in general, is everyone's, you know, hey, the robots are coming there. They're gonna take your job and they're gonna kill everyone. And if, in my book though, if you wanna figure out, you know, how things work or don't work, you just follow the trail of money. And about $130 billion goes into startups every year. 80, 85% goes into enterprise software or software related stuff. Uh, maybe 10% or so into biotech, 5% goes into other. And then there's a tiny little sliver that goes into anything hardware or robotics. And, and the capital is just not there to, to drive what's happened on the Hollywood movie screen uh, into your into your living rooms or into your corporate campuses. Uh, that said, we've got these working uh, across the country and we're, we're kind of excited about it. So uh, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I'll get to the capital mo in a moment, but let's talk about some of your products and how they are being used in corporations, uh, why there's a need to perhaps rethink security. Well, I think any senior executive um, after the events over the summer, after January 6th, after the ongoing mass shootings and the trillion dollar negative economic impact of crime every single year, I think most folks need to concede the point that our whole public safety infrastructure uh, is, is just failing. And we need new tools and new technologies to give the 2 million law enforcement professionals and, and security officers um, really smart eyes and ears for them to do their jobs much more effectively and also to provide uh, a level of, of deterrence. I think that just the simple math is there are 2 million uh, humans trying to secure 328 million Americans across 50 states running 24 seven. So at any given time, there's only about 500,000 people trying to do that job um, with the technological equivalent of a number two pencil and a notepad. And, and that's what we're, what we're trying to fix. So how does your system work in terms of, let's say I have an office park or a big corporate center, I'm thinking about security, what, what are you going to sell me? What solution do you have um, and how do you convince me that your product is better than, you know, a few of these guys that I have patrolling around at night? Sure. Uh, so two ways to think about it. Uh, one is... Uh, can I provide a physical deterrence to just stop the negative behavior in the first place, right? We have um, a half a dozen Fortune 1000 corporations as clients and uh, numerous hospitals and casinos uh, and some government facilities. And what you're wanting to do is the equivalent of, uh, let's say, Rhonda, you're driving down the highway and we put a marked law enforcement vehicle on the side of the road. I, I don't care what speed you're doing. You're going to pump those brakes. 
Uh, and that's literally what happens if you pull up into a hospital parking lot at three o'clock in the morning, you want to go steal a car. You see a five foot tall, 400 pound machine roaming around on its own. There's no one remote controlling it. There's a strobe light going. Uh, it says security on the side. You have no idea what it does. You are going to steal that car down the street and not there. And that's really what's been happening with our, our clients. Um, I think the second thing we want to do is provide either superhuman capabilities or unprecedented situational awareness for the officers and guards to be in multiple locations in different at different times and be able to cover a lot more ground. So we can read, you know, uh, a thousand license plates a, a minute. Uh, we can run a thermal scan. Uh, obviously, can do facial recognition if a client wants. Uh, we can detect a person. Uh, we can detect any mobile device in the area and treat it as, as if it's a license plate. So let's say you're a major corporation, you just fired someone last week and it, and it, it didn't go well. Um, so you can blacklist their license plate, uh, their face and their mobile devices. Uh, and then all the machines are literally on the lookout. And probably the best way to answer your question on how can I convince you to, uh, to subscribe to our service is just results. Uh, nothing more than that. And it's cost efficient results at an effective price of four to $11 an hour. Um, if you go to nightscope.com slash crime, you can see the long, long list of crime fighting wins and, and we're just getting started. I found it interesting when you talked about this disconnect with capital. Why do you think that is? Why isn't there more uh, dollars flowing into robotics and AI from your perspective? I think from a, maybe from a macro political and economic perspective, uh, your audience might benefit from understanding that the Department of Defense has a $700 billion budget. There's one person in charge, Secretary of Defense. There's a massive uh, military industrial complex to give a soldier anything he or she might ever need. And there's a Northrop Grumman, a Lockheed Martin, a Raytheon, a Boeing to build you whatever submarine jet fighter tank you need. That's great and definitely support the soldiers uh, and they should have all the cap capabilities in the theater of war. What we don't have on our own soil um, is that the US, U.S. Department of Homeland Security and the U.S. Department of Justice have effectively no federal jurisdiction, over 19,000 law enforcement agencies and 8,000 private security firms. There's no one in charge. There's no risk capital, there's no innovation process, there's no massive companies developing new advanced technologies to give these uh, officers and guards new tools and capabilities. And that's the problem I have with this is, you know, I don't understand how 2 million people get up on our own soil willing to take a bullet for you and your family and the level of technology we provide to them as a country is obviously certainly beneath the dignity of this nation. And, and that's uh, an injustice we're trying to correct. Hmm. How important is it to you to deploy your technology in corporate America? Um, you know, what, what are some of your big picture goals to where the company wants to go? When, when, when are those robots behind you going to be in uh, every single big office building? I think there's a, a, a tipping point no different than you would never build a building today without a smoke detector, right? You would be negligent. You wouldn't be allowed to do it. At some point in time, there's a tipping point where, oh, you didn't want to pay the five or 10 bucks an hour to have one of these machines patrol at your location. Something happens. You're going to be culpable. And I think I, I would encourage uh, a lot of the senior executives on online here that, you know, you put a lot of trust in your people, you invest in your people, you train them. But given the set of circumstances, um, have you really secured your facilities? Have you placed that phone call to your chief security officer and asked him or her, are you doing OK? Do you have enough budget? The security aspects for a major corporation, it's a it's a cost center, right? It doesn't help build the brand uh, and guard employee turnover rates 100 to 400 um, percent. And they don't really do anything until something goes wrong then why weren't you doing this? Why wasn't this covered? Let's go put a bunch of Band-Aids and dump a bunch of money. And then when times get tough, let's start taking it all away. And that's not uh, necessarily the best way to secure your facilities or your people. Um, and with, to answer your question, um, you know, we're patrolling inside of, you know, corporate facilities. Uh, some clients have very large campuses, parking structures, uh, in for a lot of people, uh, both indoors and outdoors and, and, and vehicles and parking structures. Um, and that provides that additional 
physical deterrence and another layer of security uh, in this slightly volatile uh, climate we live in. Can you share a story where you are working with a CEO uh, or an executive that purchased one of your products and kind of had an aha moment when they turned to your company? Sure. Um, I, obviously, I'm not, I can't name the, the corporation, but I, I think one f funny aspect of this is um, if this is not like changing. If the chief security officer wants to change the door locks in the building, like that's not a that's not a board meeting. The CEO is not involved. No one else is involved. Right. But if you want a 400 pound robot roaming around your corporate campus with your logo on it, like everyone's involved. Right? One of our largest clients, this literally went to the board of directors, the CEO, the head of facilities, the head of marketing, HR, PR, cybersecurity. Um, but the aha moment is the renewal. Just very frankly, I think they're on the second or third uh, renewal. We offer this on the machine as a service business model. So it's on annual contracts. Um, and as a startup, you know, it's really easy to build a prototype. It's really easy to maybe do a demo. You might sell a one or two. But if your client is willing to pay for your services at, at full freight, uh, work with you for an entire year, renew the contract and add more machines, that's an aha moment where you're actually creating a good amount of value for that client and the technology gets better and better over time, right? So uh, I think that's another thing that similar to Tesla, we send over over the air upgrades that uh, all our clients enjoy across the country. Can you tell us generally, and you know, obviously you're private, so you don't have to answer these questions perhaps as specifically <laughs> as I'd like, but um, what what is your growth trajectory? What can you share with us? Um, so we're backed by uh, 22,000 private investors, family offices, major corporations. Um, and I think long term, we have an opportunity to build personally, I believe, a, a $30 billion company that looks analogous to a defense contractor, but instead is focused on uh, our crazy outlandish mission to see if we can make the United States of America the safest country in the world. Uh, so it'd be focused on the Department of Justice homeland uh, security and the law enforcement agencies and 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 security guards. Um, I think we've publicly noted that you know we're contemplating a, a possible public listing. Uh, we've gotten uh, a little bit brave. Uh, we've reserved our ticker symbol on Nasdaq. It's going to be uh, KSCP. Uh, and if you want to learn more, just go to nightscope.com. Hmm. Any timing on that? Oh, that one I can't answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try to get it. Almost out of got me, Rondo. <laughs> You know, it's interesting, I think, with your company where you have so much innovation um, and a team you call yourself self-proclaimed nerds, which which I love. But within your own company, how have you had to pivot and change and adjust as the technology continues to exchange, uh, change? Oh, uh, we drop new software every two weeks. Uh, two weeks? New hardware new hardware every three to six, nine months. Um, we've operated over a million hours now in the field or got just got through our fourth winter. Um, and so we've learned a lot. <laughs> um, I, honestly, uh, very simply, the one that comes to mind, when we started the company back in 2013, we had one Intel i7 CPU on the machine and we thought, oh, we're, we're all good. And now we've got two NVIDIA GPUs plus the Intel i7, and we're kind of running out of juice. We need to add more compute and more capabilities. Um, so that's one of the ex super exciting things about this as we engage with our uh, corporate clients. The more we learn, uh, the better the technology gets because we get those uh, shared experiences and we run 24 seven. So um, we get a lot of feedback uh, literally down to the minute at every hour of the, the day and night, uh, because again, it, it is a service that we provide. How do you think your background, you worked for years at an automaker, how did that prepare you for this company that you have today? Uh, tremendously grateful. I, you know, I spent 10 years at Ford Motor Company, 12 different jobs, four different continents. If you look at my LinkedIn profile during those years, I, I look unemployable. <laughs> Um, but basically running around the, the, the company and had ba um, basically worked in almost every functional uh, area from vehicle engineering to product strategy and manufacturing rationalization, building plants. Um, as director of M&A when we were running around buying everything, I, I built a company for Ford uh, as my last uh, gig there. 
it was a tremendous uh, training and learning experience. Um, and as I like to kid around, I spent some time in Detroit, so I'm reasonably fluent about large scale hardware outdoors. Bill, uh, we have a question in the chat that uh, I think is a, just a great question. And that is, there is a belief that many still perceive that robots are only like the ones behind you and only apply to industries such as manufacturing. In fact, robotics and AI can automate many services like chat box, invoice processing. And the question is, what are your thoughts on broadening leaders' knowledge of robotics potential for all industries? And that's a great point. Thanks for that question. Um, you may not like my answer, but 95% of startups fail. And part of it is the CEO is not willing to say politely no, and we need to focus on the mission here. And the mission here is securing the country, not promoting robotics uh, and AI. Our client, the country, has a massive problem. The country's over 200 years old. We're on our 46th president, and no one's fixed it. Um, I don't believe the founders of our country ever expected a society to be built where going to work, going to school, or going to a movie theater literally came with the risk of being shot or killed. Um, and no one's kind of fixed this problem, and that's what we're determined to focus on. We're an advanced physical security technology company, not a robotics company or an AI uh, company. We just want to fix the problem. And you clearly have a lot of passion for that. Um, I security and safety, it just makes not just good sense for the country, it's it's good for business. I mean, you talk about the economic losses, potentially, um, and you're, you're so determined to make this difference. How hard is it to convince um, others that your passion is, is worth listening to and that there have to be steps taken now? Results, um, basically. It, we've helped the law enforcement agency issue an arrest warrant for a sexual predator. We helped a corporate client uh, settle a domestic abuse case, you know, where domestic violence ends up being workplace violence. We helped a security guard apprehend a thief. We stopped a fraudulent insurance claim, and the list goes on and on. And people start realizing that we need to address this problem. Let's put it in a more positive ask. Uh, just for, for one moment, let the crazy founder ha have his way and, and just say, yes, we've achieved it. We've made the United States of America the safest country in the world. Think about the economic impact there. Talk to me about insurance rates, like what happens to insurance rates if you're the safest country in the world? What happens to municipalities' uh, budgets? What happens to the viability of someone's local business? Uh, what happens to property values? or the volatility of financial markets, you would literally change everything for everyone. Um, and that's one of the most gratifying things that we've started to make uh, progress uh, heading in that direction. What right now for you are just some um, hurdles that you faced? I mean, when you mentioned that you're updating software every two weeks, that just seemed astounding to me. Um, where are your hurdles? Because it doesn't sound like it's in the execution. Hurdles? <laughs> Rhonda, this is a startup. Everything runs super smooth. Like we never miss the beat. Oh, you're right. Uh, That's <laughs> normally how it goes, right? <laughs> Hurdles are every day. Uh, this is a really complicated set of technologies. Like, as I mentioned, no one shipped anything autonomous, uh, fully autonomous without anyone, you know, inter uh, interfering with it. Um, I, I think from a computer vision standpoint, from a self-driving navigation standpoint, power efficiency, uh, these machines autonomously recharge. You kind of kind of think through that. The telecoms aren't always that consistent. So maybe you need a primary and a secondary uh, uh, connection to be able to connect with the internet. There's so much data that comes out of these machines, 90 terabytes a year per machine. How do you process all that? What do you keep? What do you dump? Uh, how do you um, improve your machine learning uh, models? How do you make a deployment go faster? Um, how do you client uh, further engage for improvements. Um, I mean, the I've got probably, and I kid you not, about three decades worth of work ahead of us. Um, but the challenge is, is it's pure execution at this point. We, we know how to get from A to B is just all the blocking and tackling, which is uh, a, le a, a bit less glamorous than, than, than others might consider. We have another uh, question in the chat, and I'll just get a real brief response to you uh, on that. Um, how do you 
prevent uh, implicit bias in terms of um, AI facial recognition, things like that? I, I may be at a step here, but to me, there is no implicit bias. It's a kind of a training problem. Like if you have a child and you tell the child that, I don't know, the Ronald McDonald clown is the work of the devil, um, he or she's going to grow up believing that, right? If you feed, you know, garbage in, garbage out. So to me, this is more of a training problem, which gets rectified over time with more and more data. Um, if you put uh, a set of information and bias it towards, you know, one set of circumstances, of course the output's going to be biased. Like, this doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, I think, as I mentioned, the technology gets better and better over time. And, you know, people start realizing that the training needs to be improved. That said, for some of the stuff that we do, it doesn't even apply. Like, I don't know how you bias the license plate reading or how you bias the thermal reading, right? It, that just doesn't actually apply. Uh, but I think as people see the benefit over time, and as we deploy more and more of these and have the meet and greet and, you know, uh, come meet the robot and name the robot and have the robot cake and, and the naming contest, I, I think people start actually the opposite, having a very, very strong emotional connection to the technology. Bill, I want to thank you so much for your time today. And I want to let everyone know that we hope you get a chance to check out Nightscope's booth in the expo area to learn more about the work they're doing. Now, please click the main stage button to the left side of your screen to tune in to our next session. Thank you. Thanks, Rhonda. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bill.